I had a guy that like he likes to be used as a chair, basically. That's his fetish. <laughs> and so like I one time just literally just sat on him like a chair and watched TV for an hour. He was fine with me watching TV, texting, whatever. Okay, what else? I'm also into ass worship because I get a lot of guys that come to me because of my butt. And okay. yeah, so that's just basically like them just basically worshiping my butt, whether it's like rubbing my butt or whatever. Do they talk to it? Yes. And they give it names? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they actually do. And then <laughs> and then I also specialize in like, you know, like the popular BDSM kinks, like uh, wax play, you know, that's candle wax. Mm-hmm. Um, rope play, that's tying them up with rope. Um, I also specialize in squirt play because I consider myself a master squirter. Oh, like and I know a lot of I know a lot of people can't do it, haven't unlocked that talent yet. So okay, wait one second. I'm just writing things down. <laughs> so, <laughs> wait, so um, are we, when we when you say squirting, you're talking about female ejaculation, right? Yes. Welcome back. We are on today with my guest, Mistress Marley on I'm Tool for This Shit podcast. I'm Angie S, the founder of AngieS.com, link in the show notes, where I coach and consult women on their health and skincare, was keeping it fun, irreverent, and most of all, practical and realistic to their own lifestyles. So I started this podcast because I want to talk about well-being beyond traditional and alternative medicine, food, skincare, and meditation. I mean, those are still very important to me, but I'm just curious to open up the conversation on less obvious aspects of health, such as sex, dating, and yes, I'm still covering health topics, obviously, because that's my passion, Um, but also relationships and feeling like a misfit. And I think those are a different way of empowering both men and women. So today I brought Mistress Marley on to talk about her work as a dominatrix. We had a lot of fun recording this. Uh, She definitely delivered and we both took a risk because we'd never met before. But I'm really glad we got to do this. So let's begin. Hello, Mistress Marley. Hi, hello. (laughs) Hello, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. No, absolutely. Look, I brought you on because I am super curious to understand more about what it is that you do and about the world around BDSM, you know, dominatrix, all of that kind of stuff. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I saw you on Instagram and you're very open and you also help other women actually who want to enter that world, but help them to do so in a a safe way. From what I can Mm -hmm. understand, you know, obviously, yes, (laughs) you know, I, I still have to learn a lot about what it is that you do. So, but um, I thought it would be absolutely great to have you on the podcast and so that you can, you know, enlighten the rest of us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so before we get started, please introduce yourself, where you live and what you do. I'm Mistress Marley. I am a pro dominatrix in New York City, but I specialize in financial domination I am also a mentor for Black and Afro-Latina women that want to join the dominatrix industry both safely and creatively. And I do this by running an organization called Black Dom Sorority. We've been around since July, so about four months strong right now. We're at over a thousand members. Wow. And yeah, so I've been in the BDSM industry now for two and a half years. So I'm still kind of, I'm not a veteran, not a newbie, but I'm in the middle and I'm still learning every day. Okay. Okay. So... Okay, quite a few things already. <laughs> you dropped <laughs> your bombs already. So uh, maybe I can just start from like from the top. You know, maybe can you explain to me what is a dominatrix and the difference between that and the fin findom? You said findom, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. So basically, findom is under the dominatrix umbrella. So a dominatrix is a dominant woman that controls submissives, or another name for it is slaves. Um, basically in a BDSM scene where basically she leads the scene, she's in control and the submissive is there to serve her. So within that, there's different umbrellas. You can be pro dominatrix, you could be a lifestyle dominatrix, and then there's fendom, which is financial domination. And fendom is basically a kink or fetish that subs like where they basically get off by handing over their money, their wallets, Basically, their whole bank account, their check, whatever it is that it might be, they get off from that. And a lot of that is online. So a lot of that is not even physical in-person work. 
So they're like, uh, I think in the US you call like Venmo, like like it's like a, a in, like a internet transfer, bank transfer. Like do they just Venmo you money? Yeah, so they're like they can send money through Venmo, Cash App, PayPal, whatever money app is out there that's safely um, that where they can transfer money. Now, I never give out my bank account because, you know, but we'll get into that later about safety and stuff. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, so basically it's done like through online transactions. Okay. So, and you mentioned you're also a pro dom. So what's a pro dom? So a pro dom versus a lifestyle dom. Um, a pro dom is basically a dominatrix that practices BDSM professionally. So basically she wants to be paid for her services. She wants to be paid for her sessions, um, anything in a professional realm, which is more so what I do. And then you have a lifestyle dominatrix who is into BDSM. She uh, necessarily doesn't care to get paid from it. She just wants to do the scene. She wants to meet subs. She wants to just build up basically a lifestyle. It's lived every day for a lifestyle dom, 24 hours. Right. Okay. 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 And I guess it's also like, I guess the girlfriend dom, right? So you could could be like in the pride in the personal life. I guess a life. Yeah, dom. yeah, it can. Yeah, it can translate into the personal life. If you are dominant in your relationship with your boyfriend or your husband, that can be considered lifestyle, also. So, how did you know that you were dumb? Like, how did they even come about? Basically, like all through college, like undergrad, I just had shitty relationships with men. Um, whether it was like on a boyfriend girlfriend level, or even like sexual relationships were really shitty. Like, never really even reaching an orgasm or knowing what that was. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. join the so, group. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, it's like a whole club out here. Yeah. But, uh, but um, so yeah, so I came to New York and I realized like I'm just sick of this shit and I'm sick of like being in relationships where I feel really submissive and I'm not getting anything from it. Mm -hmm. So that's when I was like, I want to be dominant. And, you know, I started watching like videos on YouTube and like Pornhub about, you know, female dominance or femdom or female led relationships. And I was like, this is my calling. So, okay. So that's a big jump from like feeling submissive in a relationship to then being a dom like on a professional level. Right. Is it, did you, have you found it to be almost like, um, like a transcending moment, like almost like therapeutic to be doing this? It was very therapeutic and it mm. just like becoming dominant has helped me even in my everyday life, with, like how I navigate personal relationships, business relationships, even like how I navigate meeting strangers, whether I'm at a bar or a club, like I'm less likely now to let people say what they want to say to me. And I'm more so like, no, this is how it's going to be. You're going to respect me. Like I'm just more outwardly with, with me demanding respect now. So when you say not letting people say what they want to say to me, what do you mean? Like guys just being disrespectful, like even to uh. the point that if I get like cat called on the street, like for example, yesterday a guy was like yelling across the street how nice my ass was. And I just turned around and called him a fucking loser and was like going in on him. But when I was submissive, <laughs> I would have just put my head, I would have just put my head down and kept walking or whatever. But now it's just like, I let men know that I demand respect and I let them know that right off the bat. Okay. Okay. So you're, you're definitely not scared. No. Uh-huh. Is that, so uh, it's, it sounds like almost like it's almost like a shift in like in your personal energy, you know, yeah. like you can yes. feel it, can you, when you're like, oh, you know, I've been like, um, understanding myself. So I wasn't confident at some point you just get like, you know, just fuck this. This is like enough. Right. Like something right. changes and you find a way to change it. And it seems to have been the path that's been the right, that's been the one for you. Right. And I love it. Cause like, I'm, it's even to the point where I'm no longer shy when I walk into a room. Like I just walk into a room now and I just feel like I command attention. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, co yeah, but co confidence is an energy thing, you know, I mean, your, yeah. your, your height hasn't changed. Your right. everything, your eye color hasn't changed. Nothing else has changed, you know, right. everything is the same, you know? Um, I mean, we all change a little bit over time, but you're just the same person. Um, right. At the same time you're not. So can I just ask you, do you ever get, like you said, you know, like this has changed, like even in your everyday life, walking down the street, meeting people and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Do you sometimes, I'm thinking because we'll get maybe a bit more into the Findom bit, but I saw a video uh, on Instagram where you explaining what Findom was and how, you know, some men, and this is all consensual, they would, they would yeah. want you to literally be at the cash point and, you know, insult them whilst you snatch the money out of their yeah, hands. Yeah. You know? And, and <laughs> And they get off on it, you know, somehow. So I was yeah. just thinking, 
you know, do you ever sometimes forget that the people are not clients and you like all of a sudden being like this, like to a cop or like a priest and go, Hey, come over here. You know, I don't know. No. Do you ever sometimes, you know, <laughs> no, so <Okay>. I still, <laughs> so, <laughs> no, like I'm not just out here telling priests to give me their money and like cops and stuff. So, like, no, but, um, like I, I'm very good at turning it off and still being somewhat normal in my vanilla life. So that's another term. So vanilla is basically anything that's a regular normal lifestyle, like seen as the everyday day-to-day person. Okay. Um, so I'm very good at turning off my dominant side. I'm not like 24 seven, like, oh, men suck or give me this or whatever. Like I know when to turn it off, but just within me turning it off, I'm still like demanding respect. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 You don't have to be, um, we, we can definitely be like quietly confident, you know, sometimes I can yeah. sometimes be even more powerful, but, uh, I guess like the dumb sub thing is a whole, like it's a kink, it's a fetish in it. So there has to be more of the, the play. There has to be a, a, a persona coming out. I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now that you've, you know, cause you're explaining about, you know, like relationships run great with men and so on. And now that you, now that you've, that was it like about, is it around two and a half years now you've been doing this? Yes. Yeah. So now that you've been doing this like for two and a half years, do you, have you sort of, have you gained some sort of new insight into men? Like, do you find that you see them now a bit differently? Do you find your relationship has shifted? Do you have a bit less maybe resentment um, that you had before? A bit less of that? Or how does it, how is um, it now? Well, now it's just like, ever since I became a dom, it's it's weird, but it's good at the same time. Even when I just go out to bars or lounges or just places, I can always tell who the submissive men are. I'm very oh. good. Oh. Very good at that. I'm very good at that now. It's just like, oh. and I can tell even just from off like first conversation or first sentence out of their mouth. Wow. Is it, so... And I guess they all look different. There's, there's not yes, a look. You'll, you'll, you'll never know. Like I've had like guys that were subs that you would think should be dominant just by the way they look. Or like because I've had I've had guys that I thought were subs that were really dominant. You know, like it's it's one of those things where just anyone walking on the street from from a cop to a priest to a teacher to whoever could be that submissive client that I could have one day. And you, what is it that they come to you for, you think? Like those men oh wow they have a lot there's a lot of different kinks and fetishes out there um a lot of them so I get a lot of the white subs um white Mm -hmm. males that are into black supremacy so they believe that black women are superior and they want to serve us and basically give us their money in terms of reparations yeah yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. I know there's, there's definitely one of the topics I wanted to talk to you about. Yeah. Uh, because it makes total sense to me that uh, that white man will come to you. Now, uh, now if anyone hasn't hasn't seen you, don't know, you know, because this is obviously podcast, like it's an audio mm-hmm. channel, <laughs> medium. <laughs> <laughs> audio medium. So, and in the US, you said like African-American, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So to me, it makes total sense that a white American dude would go to an African American dominatrix. Right. Um, but I was just wondering because this is like, so, and I think you call, um, I think I saw a video uh, on Instagram that you made about, it was called Ebony, Ebony Doms. Yes. Yeah. So I was wondering if, I mean, sometimes I guess, you know, you can go too much into the psychology of things, but I've been thinking about it. And so if it makes sense in the sense that, it's, it looks to me like it transcends like the feelings of all the inherited, you know, feelings that has come over generations, you know, the guilt, the anger and anything else that has, you know, been going on, you know, from before we were born, like previous generations till today, you know, cause it's still mm-hmm. going on. So, right. yeah. So my question is, you know, if there's almost like different levels into it, because like, I wonder, do you think it has more of an impact in terms of reparation because they pay you? Or do you think it would have even a greater impact if they didn't? Let's say if they were a sub, uh, not within FinDom, but just regular DOM. Mm-hmm. If they weren't paying you, let's say if it was a lifestyle, mm-hmm. do you think that would have a bigger impact or has it a big Im- impact because they pay you? And, in, and because they pay you, there's almost like a little sense of inverse control. 
I think there's like a big impact both ways because even still in just lifestyle, just knowing as a black woman that I have that mm. control over a white male. Now, when you add the money in it, to me, that's an even bigger impact. And to me, that's like even more important because it's like, yes, I'm coming to you because you're a black dom and I have this like kink that I'm into. But at the same time, I know that I appreciate you and I know that you deserve to be paid. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a great picture you've got on your Instagram about you and the white sub. And that was even before I knew about the ebony stuff that you talk, ebony domes, uh, like all the terminology and the whole area of, you know, it's uh, under the, the dominatrix umbrella. And it just made so much sense. It's a very impactful picture. I was like, yeah, it looks like about time, you know? <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, is it the one yeah. when I'm in the yellow pants? I don't know. No, you are not in pants. You are more like in the, oh, the it's not a corset and he's like, he's got a leash around his neck. Oh yeah, yeah. So the so that's one of my subs that's very loyal. He's been around for a minute, but then there's one of me in the yellow pants and that's the picture that went viral. Oh, Okay, I, I don't know if I've seen it. I may have, but the other yeah. one is the one that caught my eye. Yeah, so the yeah. one that went viral about, it was the beginning of November. That has really changed my business in like the past month. So what, he's like blown up your blown up your business? Like you get a lot yeah, more Yeah, I basically went from, I think on Twitter, I went from 2K followers to 16K overnight. Woo, what? And then wow. on Insta- Instagram, I, before you found me on Instagram, because this is my fourth Instagram page. Instagram constantly deletes me. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. on Instagram, I literally went from only 500 to where I'm at now. It's about 6,000. So all this yeah. stuff happened overnight. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, but I'm not surprised because, I mean, that picture is, and, and I don't know, I'm going to have a look at the one with the yellow pants, but the mm-hmm. picture of him and you and it's interesting because you are also very you, you know you've got you're quite you've got quite a muscular body you know like in mm-hmm. it's a very beautiful body well, uh, thank you. And, and he's quite he's quite slim frame i mean still hot like the guy like he looks he's he's good looking too mm-hmm. um but there's everything in his face like all of the expression the whole thing is very impactful and mm-hmm. i was like wow like I was like I get it this makes so much sense and, uh, <laughs> you know and I'm white I mean I'm, I'm half Danish half Algerian so there is a bit mm-hmm. of that side too like from North Africa but I I get it I was just like I was just like yeah it's a uh, I'm not surprised that one of those that like, would have gone viral mm-hmm. is that like do you like what do you feel towards your I mean I don't know do you have men and women come to you or is it, or is it just men I've had women subs before also, um, but majority of them are men. Mm -hmm. So with women, it's like a little different because like, I want to be like more gentle with them just because they're women, but I still have to be dominant because I still have to realize that they came to me to, uh, you know, be controlled and stuff. Yeah. 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 And do you, do you think some, sometimes they come to you first before they try a a male dominatrix maybe just to sort of maybe ease in or trust yeah trust um some women some women are more comfortable with serving a women a woman dominatrix before they go to a male dom because sometimes with male doms it can like it could get a little blurry of what's going on and mm. i think a lot of women don't want to feel like they're being controlled by a strange man they rather be controlled by a strange woman first mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah so yeah. yeah 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 no it makes sense it does make sense what what is the typical like what's the typical day for you like what do clients ask you to do like does it change from client to client oh it changes definitely from client to client um like no day is ever the same no kink is ever the same no fetish is ever the same so it just changes i guess from whatever the sub is into but there's a lot of stuff that like i won't do and that i'll deny them and be like no i'm not doing this uh-huh uh-huh yeah yeah, yeah, no. And those uh, are called, those are called, in the BDSM world, those are called hard limits. So hard limits are what you absolutely won't do. And so I, I've been wondering, because you know, like the, um, you know, I, when, I, when I've researched a bit into like Dom and Sub, is that what I've, what I remember is that, you know, this, the dominant, the dominant, I mean, the dominatrix is obviously the, the dominant, but actually, because the, like you were mentioning about hard limits, the sub also in a way has control because you, there has to be trust, right? So you, the dom needs to know what the limits are and like how much pain to inflict, if there is any pain, right. uh, you know, how far to go. So how do you, how do you build that trust? Like what's the dynamic really between a dom and a sub? So to me, like with my subs, I don't always just jump right into having a session with them. A lot of my subs, especially if they come to me as first timers, I tell them like, 
we have to meet in a public place. Like I just like to have a regular vanilla meeting before. Yeah. So that's like me getting to know them because outside of the work, you have to realize these are still human beings with feelings and, you know, things that they're into. And you can't just always look at them as, oh, well, I'm going to control them and like be in control, blah, blah, blah. So like, I like to have like vanilla meetings before. And I think that's a good way to establish trust. And that lets the subs know like, oh, she's really serious. Like she wants to know who I am. And it also lets them know like, hey, this is like a safety thing too. So I need to know who the fuck you are before you're coming, you know, to session with me. And so once they're in a session, like, do you have like safe words? Um, like, I guess, yes. I don't know, especially if they inflict pain, like how, yeah. Yeah. So at the beginning of the session, um, so even when they come to session, we don't always jump right into it. I give a little, like I give maybe 10 minutes in the beginning of the session to go over their hard and soft limits. Cause I make sure that it's in writing and I make sure that they verbally say it also. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I tell them like, what is your safe word? So they'll say like, if they have a safe word, if they don't have their own, we make up one on the spot, like tomatoes or something like that. Yeah. Um, um, So like they'll say their safe word. And then uh, I usually let them know what I'm doing before I do it. So like, if I'm about to like spank them or flog them, I'll be like, I'm pulling out my flogger because a lot of my sessions, I like blindfold them. When you say a what, a a fog, you're pulling out a flogger. Like, oh, yeah. Like you whip, you whip them. Yeah, so a yeah. flogger is the whip that has like the strings on the mm-hmm. bottom. So that's wow, that, what that is. Yeah. yeah, that sounds painful. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I've yeah. had it. I've had it done to me. I've had it done to me a couple times, and I think that's a big thing too. As a dom, yeah. I feel like all doms should at least uh, go through like workshops or sessions where they can feel the pain that they're going to be yes. inflicting. Yes, just so yes. they can know. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, yeah. Actually, do you know it's funny because when you say that, it just made me think. I wish that men and women could swap uh, gender for the day and mm-hmm. see how it felt like for the other one to be to penetrate. Oh, men, and went, penetrate. men wouldn't be able to. Men wouldn't be able to handle it. <laughs> no, they could. They wouldn't be. They'll be like shocked. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they'd be shocked. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So okay. So okay. So there's flogging, whipping. I guess there's spanking. Like, do they want to be like urinated on? I don't know. Like, what sort of stuff do they? They, they come nowadays to a job for? So what I specialize in is I specialize in pegging. So, oh yeah, so that's, uh, okay, so I know what it is, but can you explain in case you pull so, down? <laughs> pegging is basically when the dom or the woman penetrates the sub with a strap-on or a dildo. Yeah. So I specialize in pegging. I love pegging. To me, that's the ultimate power dynamic right there. Yeah. That's, like, that's yeah. the ultimate power switch. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people do pegging even in just their like intimate relationships. It's starting to be more yeah. introduced. Like pegging is starting to get really popular. Yes, absolutely. And, yeah. And especially because for men, that's where they can actually have a complete full body orgasm. Yeah. Yeah. For men, that's like, it's quite powerful, but it's just got, it's so taboo because people place um, body parts with sexual orientation when actually exactly. it's, those two things are not related. We used to think that, but I right. think nowadays, like, you know, it's all changing a bit more. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So do those men, do you feel like, do they, I imagine there'd be a mixture of men who are in relationships and some who aren't, right? So they mm-hmm. sort of come because they want, they may not want to cheat. So they come to you because like a professional exchange. Would that be, right. would that be fair, yes. fair assessment? Yes. Yeah, so I've had clients before that are in relationships. Um, but I've probably had clients that were in relationships that I didn't know because a lot of them don't tell me and that's not required of me. I don't go no. into sessions saying, Hey, do you have a girlfriend? Do you have a wife? Like, <laughs> you know, cause I don't no. want them asking me my personal business and stuff like that. So yeah. yeah. No, no, fair enough. But actually can I, can I ask you like how, how is your dating life? Like, do you, cause I feel like, you know, after working day, do you feel like, Oh, so done with men? Like, you know, but in the sense like if someone is like, um, this is going to sound really crude, but like, you know, I always imagine like someone who's either a midwife or someone who, who's a gynecologist, let's say the, the partner is, is a woman, they may not want to be going home to another woman, you know, it's like, again, it's like, you know, you may have like saturation. Do you, do you get that? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So basically like even in my dating life, I like I'm dating now and I can be submissive in my dating life. Okay, I was going to ask but, you about yeah, that. Yeah, but the thing mm-hmm. is, the thing with me being submissive, like the guy has to be like a one in a million type guy. Like he has to absolutely like have all the things checked off on my list that I like. Yes. And there's been times where I've been on Tinder dates and stuff like that. And like within the first 10 minutes, I'm already like, I'm done with this guy. I'm going to get this free food. 
but I'm done with him after. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but like, um, I'm dating now and I think I'm submissive to him, but I'm also like still dominant and he's still like, he knows everything I do. He's always asking questions about it. He's always interested in it. So I think that's a big part too, because I've been on dates where I've told guys I'm a dominatrix because this is a part of my life that I don't hide. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's all over the internet anyway. So it's like, whatever. But like, I tell guys that I'm a dominatrix and I've had some guys be like, Oh, um, I'm not with that. You're not going to be dominant to me. And it's like, okay, well, first of all, I never said you were a client. I'm just telling you what Mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. But yeah. It makes sense that you said that you, you won't be submissive to just any kind of guy. It's a a special kind. Cause I mean, I've, I've noticed that, and I'm not dominatrix, uh, not that, I mean, not, not that I know of, but like I've noticed that my dynamic with different men on dates, but with men on dates change from men to men in terms of like, if the guy, like, cause I can be very dominant and I don't mm-hmm. want to, that's the thing. I don't actually want to, I want to go on a date and relax. And I said, I actually want the man to take the lead. Right. And, but if a man is a bit, you can, you can feel it. Like you said, like it's, like we were saying previously, it's a bit like an energy. Mm-hmm. Um, for me to be able to be more submissive or be more feminine, basically, because I love being really feminine uh, because I'm I'm so bossy <laughs> the rest of the time, you know, like, right, like you, know, right. you have your own business, you have to always be making decisions. You always have to do, do, do. And so when I can just be and be feminine, but the guy has to, I have to feel that I can trust that he's got it, that he just he's in control of himself and he's calm and it's not mm-hmm. always um that's not the case for all the men and I think some women or men you know depend so some people prefer a partner that is more more alpha more dominant and other people prefer someone who's a bit more you know uh, has more feminine energy to them and yeah right. so yeah for me I can feel like I get really busted and I, and I get annoyed at myself because I get annoyed at them and yeah, so yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm the same way I'm the same way sometimes I can see myself being like okay just calm down like it's okay <laughs> to, it's okay to sit back and it's okay to not feel like you have to be in control of everything so like mm-hmm. I have to get in my head sometimes and tell myself that yeah but I think it's, but, I, but to be fair, it is a dynamic between two people. So I've also come to the terms of like, I don't have to feel guilty if I was a bit more bossy there because effectively I couldn't trust his leadership because at the same time, it's all good to let someone lead, but you don't want them to drive you into a ditch. You know, right, you want them to stay right. on the road. And I think this is also important with what you were saying at the beginning, beginning of this interview is that, you know, you are in control. Your energy has changed. You have your... Well, I could imagine like your aura, your magnetism has changed from who you were maybe three years ago. And so men can feel that, women can feel that, and you can sense when someone is looking for that when you're out exactly. and about. And it's all exactly. about that. Yeah, exactly. They, they come to you because they know you're not going to drive them into a ditch. You're going to take them to their destination. Exactly. That's exactly. That. Yeah. It comes oh my down. God, I love that. I, that's a good quote. Listen, you can quote it. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't That's even a come, great quote. <laughs> you know, it doesn't come from me. I think, do you know what? Oh, oh, I think it comes from um, the Jackson Derrick, maybe. Okay, I've never heard of him. I'd be quite interested in, in talking a little bit more about the findom. So from what you were explaining before is, you know, is about how basically men pay you money. Um, mm-hmm. And I think online you call it tribute. Is that correct? Yes, it's called a tribute. Tribute, okay. So... How how did you even come about Findom? So basically, I came about Findom. So I I was at a tough time in my life. So this is maybe like, uh, when was this? This was August of, I want to say, 2017. Um, I had like lost a job. I had broken my foot. I had got out of a bad relationship. Like, it was just so much going on at once. And I was really just like living paycheck to paycheck, barely getting by, having to like ask family members to borrow money. So I randomly just got on Google and I was just like, how to make money as a woman woman being sexy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was things like webcam modeling and modeling and stripping and stuff like that. And I, like, kept scrolling down, scrolling down, and I saw something that said financial domination. And I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and I clicked, I clicked it, and it, like, brought me to Twitter and, like, you know, seeing all the girls that were doing it. And I was like, wow, this is, like, a whole new world. 
But the thing is, like back then, there weren't a lot of doms that were willing to mentor or anything. Like there were some doms where I would message them like, hey, I see you do this. How do I get into it? And they would just completely be rude, like figure it out on your own. Like we all had to figure it out. Stop trying to get free advice, like really rude people. Uh, So that led me to having to research. And I did intensive research even before I set up my Twitter page. I was like, I want to make sure I'm doing this right. And then within a week of me having my page, I got my first tribute of $100. Wow. And I was like, yep. Time to switch gears. <laughs> so, so, so yeah. what does it mean for the? So, I guess is, is it mainly men paying, paying the money? Yeah, yeah. So it's mostly men. So, what does it mean to them? Is it has it got to do with the? Because this is different from the ebony dam, right? Or is it similar? Or is it in the same so, vein? So still, so within it is you could be within fin dom, you can be a fin dom, which is F I N D O M M E. Which means and, which is just financial dominatrix shortened. Mm-hmm. So within that, there's something called ebony fandoms, which are black women that are mm-hmm. fandoms. Yeah. So that's basically what that hashtag is. And so do you get fandom and ebony fandomed? You said like, what? Do you, get, do, you get, do you get both? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm using them as a verb now. I don't know if that's correct. But like, <laughs> do, you, <laughs> do you get fandomed and ebony fandomed? Or is it? just fin domed so like, the, the subs that pay are called fin subs okay yeah so fin subs will come to a fin dom to have a session and so do the fin subs so is it is it like is men from all kind of different heritage yeah all over and most of the time with with fin dom you don't really see what these men look like because a lot of them want to be kept anonymous well, that's so a lot great. Of, that's fine. Yeah. You don't have so to a lot of the time, uh, so a lot of because I mean, you're really only getting money from them online. You don't meet them in person anyway. So, and so, what what does it mean to them? Like, why do they do that? To them, well, a lot of them are anonymous because a lot of them either have like high profile jobs or maybe they have like a wife or girlfriend. You know, you know the yeah. different reasons why people stay anonymous. Like, they just yes. don't want people knowing they're into this. So, like a lot of them, like you'll never see a picture of them, but they'll send you money or whatever. And like a lot of them have it set up where even when they send you money, their real name isn't on it. And I tell a lot of girls, even as fin doms, when you set up these payment accounts to get paid, don't put your real name on there. Yeah. Is that part of the safety training that you teach? Yes, that's definitely a part of the safety training to not put your real name on there. So what about the safety when you, because you mentioned that there's there's obviously in real life money exchange too, you know, when you go to the cash point or or meet in public, how do you stay safe? Like, how do you know it's safe to go? So basically what I do to stay safe when I'm doing cash meets, I always make sure that it's in public. And to me, I like doing it in public also because it's just like, it's a whole like power dynamic thing, knowing that like people are watching you do this. And a lot of the subs are okay with that. But like I usually do it in public. So being in New York is is a quite, it's a bit easier for me because there's always people around. And I always do it like in an ATM of my choice or whatever, or whoever I bank with. So it's just like that. And then even before then, there's different apps you can use. So like, there's like, they'll never get my phone number. So I'll use an app like Kick to talk to them or, you know, a Google number where it's not my real number, it's just a Google number. Yeah. Do you know what? I've been, um, I've heard about this Google number thing uh, from like girlfriends. So, you know, for when you do the, when you do the apps, you know, dating apps, um, like Hinge mm-hmm. or Bumble and stuff. And actually to not, because they not to give out your number so you don't get like you know bombarded. So I've heard about Google. I've never heard about Kit. Is that a similar thing? Yeah. So Kit is just like a, a. It's not a phone number exchange. It's just like a username app that people use. And oh. Kit is very big in the uh, femdom and fendom like world because it's a way to like discreetly talk to people and you don't even have to give out that much information. You just like give out a screen name. Right. So is that what you do? Like you'll say so if you're on Twitter and you'll have your um, dominatrix account and then you'll have your kit username for example or you just yeah. said it, that's that's one way to do it okay okay yeah so basically so okay so basically men are giving you money just for existing yes that must be quite nice right <laughs> that must be quite nice like, it's yeah. amazing it's amazing do you so do you sometimes uh, like how do you feel and I don't know, I guess that maybe the dating culture we see varies from different regions and even within the US it could change, but uh, Europe and America, so I'm based in Europe, in London. So mm-hmm. I don't know, like, so when you're still used to men just giving you money for breathing, when you're out dating, when you're in a relationship, um, I'm not talking about the courting stage and dating when the man takes you out for dinner and stuff, but when you're in a relationship, do you 
kind of expect that to carry on for the men to keep on paying for every everything or is this a different dynamic when i'm dating i expect the man to pay for everything because uh-huh. even before yeah. even before being a fandom i was a sugar baby oh were you yeah and i used to mentor women on that also how do you yeah how do you, what's that mindset i don't know like how do you so my first mindset is if you ask me out on a date, you should pay. Yeah. That only makes sense because you came and bothered me. Yeah. So, <laughs> you, you, so I was minding my business. You came and asked me. Yeah. So I feel like if you asked, then you should pay for it. I also feel like if I asked to be taken somewhere that you should pay for it. And if you can't pay for it, that should be made known through text message before. So I don't come out and waste my time. Um, I've gone Dutch before, but it was like in a a tense relationship, like, you know, being together for a year or whatever. But like, even the guy I'm dating now, I remember like, I tried to just, you know, buy us a round of drinks and he was just like, hell no. Mm -hmm. And he felt kind of like offended by that. Yeah. 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 yeah, So I think like, even like when I became a sugar baby and being a past sugar baby, and even now, like I still, you know, do some sugaring, but, um, it kind of set the tone for me to know like, Hey, there are men out here that will literally pay for everything and you'll never have to touch anything. Like they'll pay from having dinner to calling your car, to buying you gifts, to just giving you cash, you know, just to have. So when I got into that dynamic, that's why I was just like, I refuse to accept, you know, anything less. And not saying that I expect every man to date to be wealthy and rich because I, you know, I'm 25. So I'm dating guys my age range and, you know, we're all trying to get our shit together and, you know, whatever. But I just feel like, you know, I just like the man should pay because we go through so much as women just to even get ready. Like you said, just to do all those things. Oh, and, not I know. Only, um, and not only that, like when we go out on these dates, we're risking our safety. Yeah. I think, do you, okay. So I'm going to ask you this question. How do you keep your head straight and your back straight and just, you know, very confident when they've paid for everything and pay for everything all the time? How does that, how does that work? How do you not expect like, you know, like, how do you say safe doing that? I see it as like, you are a consenting adult. You are paying your money. I did not make you pay your money, but I don't, like, I never feel like a guilt behind it. I never feel like, oh, well, because he paid, now I have to go have sex with him. Like, I've never felt like that. I felt like, okay, he paid because he was supposed to pay and he knew he was supposed to pay and that's that. Yeah. So whether I go home with you or not, that's my decision. So like, I feel like a lot of women feel guilt tripped into that. They're just like, Oh, well he paid. So, you know, I have to have sex with him Mm -hmm. or like he paid. So now I really have to like really be under him and stuff like that. But I never feel that way. I feel like, okay, you paid what's next. Yeah, no, you're right. And I think also this is, um, that's the thing is I've, I mean, I've never had to do anything I don't want to like, and I've never felt obligated to do anything because the guy paid. I think when I was younger, I was against them playing anything because I I was worried that's how I was going to feel or mm-hmm. they were going to have a power uh, over me. But I think, like you said, like, you know, I think definitely as a woman, you know, as in a partnership, I think that you, you bring more. So let's say the guy, let's say he has like more financial security, mm-hmm. but you, you bring other things to the relationship too. The same thing is that he brings more than just his wallet, you know? So it, it, like you don't you're not just with someone just because of that there has to be right. things and the same thing for him he's not he's not with you just for the sex if he was just with you just for the sex he's a low value guy and if you with him right. just for the money low value woman right so there is more I guess you know that there's obviously there's a lot more to this and there's more depth but um I think it's I think what it comes down to is chivalry you know yeah like, pull the chair out, open the door you know pay for the meal it's just all those all exactly. those little things make a big difference you know exactly exactly mm-hmm. So I know you mentioned that, you know, that when you, you know, that the, when you see someone, they know what you're doing. Um, mm-hmm. Does your family know what you do? Yes. And my mom and dad love it. <laughs> so oh, I get wow. That, yeah. I get yeah. that. I get that question a lot. Like, oh, how's your family? Blah, blah, blah. Your friends. Like my mom and dad, they, like when I, whenever I do my Instagram lives, you know, answering questions or talking about the education, my mom and dad are logged in and like watching my lives. Yeah, they, like they want to come to my classes. They're always asking what I'm doing. I think the only thing with my my dad was he was just more so concerned about the safety. He just he just wanted me to be safe. You know, that's that's instinct anyway. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And but my mom is always at like asking questions. My mom is always just like, what does this mean? What does that mean? And she, you know, you know, she wants me to be safe also, but like, everyone's like, oh, your parents must judge you. I'm like, no. So, and my theory is if my parents don't give a fuck, nobody else's opinion matters about what I do. Yeah, absolutely. I think yeah. that's, that's quite, um, that's fantastic because that's, that's a big hurdle. Mm-hmm. If, you know, whatever it is that we do, if the parents don't approve, it's, you know, it will impact people in different ways. And you know, some people are, they deal with it much better. And for right. others, it can be a block. So the fact that they, wow, that this for you, that's, yeah, that's fantastic. Because I think it's, you may as well, because it's a, even if, a, let's say, if they don't understand, they don't make you less, they don't protect you more by by not supporting you because it means that you're not, you would be less willing to go to them if something went wrong or if you wanted, if you had a bad day at work. It's mm-hmm. good to be able to say, oh, today was like this. And <laughs> today, right, but today right. was great. Today was great. Can I share it with you? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, to have them involved. That's fantastic. That's absolutely, yeah, yeah. I, I'm always like really... Um, um, in awe and admire like parents who just you know regardless what their child do and stuff and you know especially with this outside convention you know yeah um, yeah because you do you do sound like I have to say you sound like a very like confident well put together woman you know mm-hmm. um, and that's why I'm glad I got you um, on here because I think sometimes people sort of may have ideas or thoughts I don't know what they're thinking but they you know. Yeah, you you sound like just like a normal person. Just oh, thank. Talk. Well, that's a compliment. I'd oh, like to it? be seen as a normal person. <laughs> you know, because honestly, I wasn't too sure um, who I was going to get today. Honestly, mm-hmm. you, hadn't really, you hadn't spoken before. Um, I saw some videos. Obviously, I liked it, but I was just like, I, effectively, I don't actually really know you, so it'd be it'd be interesting. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm yeah, gonna... I get that. I get that actually from a lot of people because you know. I think there's a lot of women that are fin doms or fem doms and they're very into this industry, but I don't think some of them know how to put it together in an educational type way, you know, or like know how to put together what they do and why they love it, you know? And I, that's what I'm trying to teach of, yes, you can be into this, but you also need to know the education behind it and different things. It's more than just a money grab. Yeah, no, absolutely. Cause I think, I mean, I'm, I'm repeating myself here like a woman, but I think, you know, like you were saying, with the what, well, even just with the, the money and the dating and and findom and stuff, and mm-hmm. I think because what I've been, I haven't actually talked about this on the podcast, but I talked about this like in um in a in a separate Facebook group about how, you know, something that has taken me the longest time to learn was that you know the thing about sex and how you know just withholding it almost like a bargaining chip for a relationship is not a healthy thing to do. And if it's safe for man, it's safe to have sex with them like on the first date or before they, or whenever you have sex, you know, um, mm-hmm. if they decide, if they judge you, decide not to see you, it means that all the value they see in a woman is the sex and, or like almost like that's it. That's, there's nothing else to be seen. And that's mm-hmm. a low value guy. And if the same thing with a woman, let's say if the woman only goes after the size of the wallet for the guy and nothing else. Well, that's also like, that's, that's just as, you know, as like nasty as the other way around. Right. So we all have to see, we have more than just that one thing. One thing is just part of it. Like sex is part of a relationship. It's part of mm-hmm. an exchange energy. You know, if you want to, you want to have it, you have it, stay right. safe. But you know, you do it because that's what you want. Not because you're hoping to get something out of the person. Same thing right. with money. You know, if the guy you're dating is just trying to buy you, is a very different dynamic to him just like actually just because he can and he wants to do it and he's hoping to get to know you more and, you know, and the relation that is part of a bigger, of a bigger picture. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there, is there anything that sort of maybe we, we haven't, we haven't covered that you'd like to, to bring up or. Oh, definitely the different kinks. So I think I was, I think I was, I think I was talking about what I specialize in. Um, Go ahead. So pegging was one of them. And then I also specialize in face sitting, which I love. Okay. Okay. Wait. So what face sitting? So is that him going down on you while you sat on his face or he's just. Yeah. Face sitting is literally just like him on the floor and me just like sitting on his face. And that can be like completely with clothes on. So it can be with clothes or without clothes? Yes, but I prefer to do it with clothes or maybe in lingerie. It's never just me strictly naked. And how long can that be for? I had a guy that, like, he likes to be used as a chair, basically. That's his fetish. <laughs> and so, like, I one time just literally just sat on him like a chair and watched TV for an hour. He was fine with me watching TV, texting, whatever. 
Okay, what else? I'm also into ass worship because I get a lot of guys that come to me because of my butt. And okay. yeah, so that's just basically like them just basically worshiping my butt, whether it's like rubbing my butt or whatever. Do they talk to it? Yes. And they give it names? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they actually do. And then <laughs> and then I also specialize in like, you know, like the popular BDSM kinks, like uh, wax play, you know, that's candle wax. Mm-hmm. Um, rope play, that's tying them up with rope. Um, I also specialize in squirt play because I consider myself a master squirter. Oh, and I know a lot of I know a lot of people can't do it, haven't unlocked that talent yet. So, okay, wait one second. I'm just writing things down. <laughs> so, <laughs> wait, so um, are we, when we when you say squirting, you're talking about female ejaculation, right? Yes. Okay, so you can do it on command. Yes. Or do they have to like bring you to the point? Or do you bring yourself to the point? How I bring you- myself to the point and I like okay. I'll make them watch. How did you learn yourself to do that? I learned that when I moved to New York too. New York just unlocked so many things inside of me. It's, it um, it sounds like I need to visit New York or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, um, so like um So like all through like even living in North Carolina, all through undergrad, I never experienced with toys or anything like that. I was just not like sexually like intelligent like that. When I moved here, I think I bought my first toy just randomly on Amazon, and that's when I discovered I could do it. Oh, okay. What toy was that then? Because I think I think we women need to know. It's like <laughs> so any any type of toy that's like a clit stimulator. So I don't uh-huh. like really I don't get vibrators that are like penetration. Uh-huh, I get the uh-huh. ones that are just like that go on your clit. Okay. Okay. And that's that's how I learned how to do it. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And so they want to be so you, so that was the kink where man wants to be squirted on. Yes. Uh huh. Or they just want to watch, I guess. Also, they want to watch, and then I'll squirt, yeah. and then I like I'll make them do something like lick it up or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and what else? Oh, do you know it's funny because when you say lick it up, actually in tantra, um, mm-hmm. that has like it's to, it's to do with like they talk about this is like it's actually I'm probably completely misquoting it now because it's been years ago now. Um, but what I learned was there's to do with it's actually a good thing too for men to drink it because. <laughs> Yeah. A bit like what men say to us, right? Zinc and iron. But um yeah. <laughs> but it's actually the same to do with like it's uh, because it's a life force and so you're drinking life basically. It's like a right. rejuvenating situation, yeah. Something like right. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what else? so I'm also into feminization. So that's basically when you make a man dress in women's clothing. Yeah. So I'm into like the makeup and hair and like and you know, I get a lot of men that come to me for that fetish and that kink specifically. And so is that, is that still a sub or is that just, that's not, a, is that, would, would that person still be a sub in that when you um, put the makeup on and dress them like women? Yeah. So they're definitely, um, they're still subs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Anything and then else? I'm also into CBT, which is cock and ball torture. That's men that like to be kicked in the nuts basically Ooh! or have their like penis stepped on. No. no. Yes. Okay, but it is is it flaccid when you step on it? it can't yes. Be okay, yeah, so yeah, cause you could break it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And do you, do you do that with shoes or without shoes? Uh either or. Mostly with shoes though. I like to do it with high heels. I can just picture men listening to this and just grabbing their groin like <laughs> ow. <laughs> or either or either oh, trying okay, to yes. either trying to book they yeah, I was going to say, yeah, yeah what's the link in the show notes? Yeah. And then I'm also into something called J-O-I, which stands off stands for jerk off instructions. It's just basically, like, I can do that online, too. It's basically getting on a video call and just instructing a guy how to jerk off. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, so, okay, so, oh, wow, okay, that's ultimate control in a way. Because that's the and, thing they always do themselves. Right. Oh, and then you tell them. Mm-hmm. the last one is SPH, which is small penis humiliation. So there's some guys that know they have a small penis and they want to be humiliated for it. Is that like a therapeutic thing for them? I think so. And like, you know, a lot of guys are into the humiliation aspect. So I think they get off by just being told by a woman that they have a really small dick. So, you know, when we say small, we're talking like micro penis, like, you yeah. know, like the size of a cork from a yeah, like, champagne bottle. Like, yeah. Yes, like micro penis, maybe yeah. like maybe the biggest, maybe like three inches. Yeah, or something well, like that. You know, I wonder. I wonder if, like, you know, because I, I have been thinking sometimes. I'll be like, okay, what if I meet a guy, everything's going great, and then, you know, he's got micro penis, and <laughs> this is. I mean, if I'm giving too much information now, I was just wondering. 
I think like if the guy is great, because I was dating someone who was actually like, it was really, really cool. And, and I was thinking like, let's say if he had like a micro penis and I mean like a mm-hmm. cool size, like a champagne bottle cool size, if he was willing to put on a strap on, because I think if a man, like it's not just about their size, it's also who is it attached to, you know? Mm-hmm. And if it's attached to a good guy and if he's willing to, to be creative and work around it, but there's something that would have to come from them because you can't say to them, okay, this is really small. Can you put a strap on? Yeah, right. That's humiliating, you know, like for yeah. no good reasons, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. I mean, do you know what those guys like that you meet who do the small penis humiliation? Do you know how they work around it in the partnership? Do they ever tell you that? No, they don't really tell me and I don't really ask them. Yeah. But, um, you know, a lot of these guys aren't really having sex either. They're just into the BDSM aspect of things. Yeah, and, and and also like let's say if they even had a if they had a partner if or when they have a partner, it, not all are interested in that either. You know, for some for some right. women and for some men, it would be oh perfect, great because you know they may have issues as well. It may be painful for them on penetration. There may be all kinds right. of things. So for them, it would be actually a perfect deal. There's always a perfect match for someone, isn't there? Yeah. Oh, always. Always. Uh, any other kinks? Um. Those are about like it, like my favorite ones. Now I do have hard limits that I won't do. And that's to me, there's this one called toilet training. Okay, go cool. tell us about that. Basically a guy that wants you to like pee and shit on him, like using like a toilet. Wow. Shit as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I'd heard about this years ago about uh, people apparently they're freezing their shit and then they'll have like a shit party. They'll throw it and then throw it on each other. Yeah, so that yeah. that's really intense. That's something that's I won't intense. do. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you don't want to be catching bacteria and you know, pink eye. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. I mean, yeah. the thing like this is just the smell and the safety and just the look of it. It's yeah, it's intense. Right. Yeah. But yeah, so that's like one of my hard limits that I absolutely won't do at all. Any other hard limits? Um, some guys like want full like castration like for you to like make them bleed out their penis and stuff and i'm just oh. like i'm not I'm like that goes into territory that sounds crazy so like they want to they want to be cut yeah not, not fully cut but like enough to bleed yeah basically wow wow yeah 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 is um um and now I've gone black now because I just had that picture in my mind. <laughs> I go black. Um, okay, yeah. Well, I guess yeah, there's, but there is all kinds of kings. There is definitely all kinds of kings. Oh, this is what I wanted to ask you. Is there like, how did you, you know, like things like the bondage and all these different things that you do that could effectively you know, could go wrong physically, you know, the bondage could go wrong, the uh, wax uh, fetish could go wrong, all kinds of things go wrong. Did you go, like, is there, like, an evening class you went to? Like, how did you learn about this? So, like, there's different workshops. There's this one website called fetlife.com. And fetlife is basically for everybody that wants to get into kink or that's already into kink. And it's a great place to learn. And basically you can search for workshops and different things. So like I've been to events where like I've learned how to do, you know, rope tying or learn how to do bondage or learn how to pro- properly flog somebody. So that's what that goes back to what I said about, you know, doms in the industry need to attend these workshops to make sure they're doing things safely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because I couldn't imagine like giving myself away to someone who didn't know what they were doing because they right. could effectively really hurt you. Um, but that, but that's kind of part of the, I guess, the excitement, the arousal for your clients is that as long as they, they trust that you know what you're doing, you know, it's like, which is, you know, obviously it sounds like you do. So like mm-hmm. it's that thing of like, wow, she could really hurt me, but it's like, she knows what, what she's doing and I can just relax. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to to touch on that maybe we haven't? Hmm. Oh, I want to touch on my organization I have called Black Dom Sorority. Absolutely. Um, Go ahead. So it's a collective of Black and Afro-Latina women. And the reason why I choose to mentor Black and Afro-Latina women is because I feel like we're the most underserved community. Um, I feel like we need to get our names out there in the BDSM industry. And like I said before, when I first started out, there were a lot of doms that were like not into helping me and I never want another like black or Afro Latina woman to go through that. Mm. So that's why I created this organization. And like I said, we've been around since July at over 1k members. We're from all over. We're in, we, I have girls in the UK. I have girls in 
the United States. I have girls in Africa. I have girls all over that are in the group. And basically, it's like a sisterhood. We get together. We go to events. We have events. We give each other advice. You know, like, we, we'll say, like, oh, this guy has been known to be a scammer. Let's put him on our blacklist. You know, things like that. Yeah. So, yeah. And we talk about safety. And it's just a really, really great group. And just for me to see it grow from only having, like, five members now to a 1,000 in four months has been, like, amazing. No, that's amazing that you got that many members. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. insane in that amount of time. And I, I think this is brilliant because... It could be, and it could effectively be a very isolating world, you know. Like, it, it, let's say, even if let's say if someone doesn't tell their friends or their parents or family because they just want to figure out for themselves, mm-hmm. that having that community, and even if you have a support system, to have that community must be like so important to be able to bond with people who understand. And you don't need to explain shit, you know. You can just yeah. go and say, "This is what happened today," and you don't have to yeah. explain. And someone can say, "Okay, this is what I do when that happens." Yeah. Exactly. Because I actually, I, I've been wondering about um, the sort of different um, areas, you know, like within that for them sex work. And I don't know if you like consider yourself like as a sex worker. And I know there's like, do, you know, there are different types, you know, like I'll say like job titles, you know, like um, escort, dominatrix. Mm-hmm. Um, there's people who work in porn. Um, there's in a, and sometimes they all cross over. Like, can you sort of explain to us a bit, like, the terminology of, of them, or how, or where do you define yourself, and how do you feel about, I guess, sex work, like the sex work industry or sex workers? So, sex work is basically basically a consensual act between two adults, and it's basically whether it's sexual or non-sexual. Because I think the stigma people have is that sex work is penetration. Sex work is not. Not all sex work involves sex. So basically, sex work is consensual. It's a transaction. And a sex worker can be a stripper, escort, prostitute, dominatrix, sugar baby, webcam model, porn star, Snapchat model, whatever it is, it might be. All of those fall under sex work. And the big thing right now is the decriminalization of sex work over here in the United States. Because basically, sex workers are more likely to get arrested and, you know, put in prison than their pimps or their johns or whatever it may be. So I think basically I work for the decriminalization of sex work because I want it to be decriminalized. I want it to be where these women, if they get caught or whatever you may call it, that they're not going to prison. Um, I think if it is decriminalized, there could be more safety measures put in. Then people ask, well, why don't you want it legalized? The reason why I don't want it legalized is because once it becomes legalized, that's when the government moves in and, you know, start taxing things. That's when, like, pimps and johns are more likely. Like, there's more men that will probably sign up to be pimps if it's legalized, and it won't be as safe for us. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and is, um, I mean, do you you have a pimp or a john? Because you mentioned... No, so I don't as a dominatrix because I run everything. But there are some yeah. girls that are escorts or that are prostitutes that have pimps or johns. And I think maybe like also like you were saying, you know, about it still being criminalized in a way, like a, seen as a criminal act or something. Um, mm-hmm. Is that I wonder if you know because also because the, there's two different things, right? There's like there's the sex workers who are consensual, like yourself, who made a conscious choice, mm-hmm. and then there is. People confuse that sometimes with like sex trafficking where women and men are being trafficked through different countries and states uh, without their consent and they're basically kept as prisoners or slaves basically. Mm -hmm. And so those are different things. And so I think, yeah, I think once people understand that actually sex work is also a choice, can be a choice, Mm -hmm. um, it may, you know, it will, it will change that the view on it because sometimes people think oh is this was that the only the last resort was it because she had no choice because she maybe right went- right no sex sex work is definitely a choice and it's definitely at will yeah. it's consensual yeah yeah exactly i think it's because there, there is definitely the discernment between that and when it's not and i think when yeah when you're talking about decriminalizing it and and, and empowering uh women as well it's because it's for those those who've chosen it as a career, it's, a, it's a their lifestyle, it's, it's a job. Exactly. And that's just, it's a choice. As a, yeah, yeah, exactly. What would you say to your 18-year-old self? Oh, wow. To my 18-year-old self, I would say have more confidence. Stop thinking that you have to submit to every man you meet. I would definitely say, like, know who you are and know you have purpose and know that, you know, what everyone else has to say about you is all smoke and mirrors. I would say that for sure. 
Yeah, I love that. The uh, the smokes and mirrors. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. you can't let that stop you. That's just exactly. not good enough anymore. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And what do you not put up with anymore? I don't put up with men talking shit to me. I don't put up with that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I refuse to. <laughs> yeah, good, 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 good. Um, and so please tell us, where can people find you? So you can find me on Twitter at Eyes on Fire. That's E-Y-E-S-X on fire. And then you can also find me on Instagram at the chocolate dom, D-O-M-M-E underscore. And I'm also on YouTube as the chocolate dom. And how can uh, people find out about your um, sorority program? Is there a website or? So you can find out my, find out about my sorority through my Twitter and also through my Instagram Um, The sorority is more so by, like, you know, more information is more so by messaging me because I have now, like, I put in a three-day vetting process. So if you do want to join the sorority, you have to go through a vetting process, stuff like that, Um, only because the group is getting more popular and I want to make sure old members are safe and that I'm letting in the right people. Yeah. So people, they basically need to send you a DM and that's how it starts, yeah? Yes. So they'll send me a DM and you can leave your email address with me and then that's how you'll be added. And basically I do a vetting process every Monday. There's like a new round of girls that, you know, get inducted every Monday. Perfect. And um, now, look, thank you so much for for being game and answering my questions. And oh, my gosh. No, thank for, you for having such amazing questions. Oh, <laughs> I was just very curious. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? You might, you might become a dominatrix today. Who knows? Oh, yeah, who knows? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's it. That's our episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Please don't forget to rate, review, subscribe on iTunes, follow on Spotify, or for all of the other platforms, whichever way you show love is how you can support this show. Drop me your questions or suggestions for future episodes via the website at angie-s.com. Link in the show notes. Or come and find me on Instagram. I have two accounts. One is too old for the shit podcast and the other one is health lifestylist. Again, links in the show notes. See you next week, and until then... Using health inappropriately.